Good evening, everybody. And in the interest of time, I think we'll get started. Um, we will first, uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the featured uh, lecture um, for the practice operations group. Uh, we'll take care of some business matters first so we get it out of the way. And then we have, we are very excited to have a distinguished speaker with us today and promises to be a very um, educational and informative session. Um, the, I'll get some of the business um, part of this meeting out of, out of the way. Um, first of all, um, introduction of steering committee members. So current members, um, including myself, uh, I'm Sham Subramanian. We have uh, Adele uh, Bisley Marcus, Chad Case, um, Stuart Gray, Jason Golbin, uh, Pradeep, Ramachandran, I've been see his, seeing his tweets. I don't see him here today. Salim Sarani, um, Alexander Sai, Kim French couldn't be here. She's at a different uh, uh, engagement for chess, uh, for the Chess Foundation, and Michael Nelson, I think he's at the same engagement as well. I wanted to extend a warm welcome to our new members, Humayun Anjum, who is here with us today, and uh, Raghu Sundaram, uh, hasn't been able to make it. And then we actually have, for the first time, a fellow in training, uh, Megan Fisk. And I believe she is out of country and couldn't be here. Um, this is my last, um, uh, as uh, chair of the uh, last term, as chair of uh, the network. And uh, pleased to hand over this uh, responsibility to Adele, who informs me I still continue for two more years as ex officio. <laughs> He didn't know he's not going away. <laughs> right. So, um, and uh, the new vice chair would be uh, Salim Sarani. Um, Chest, uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, Chest 2017 is upon us, uh, and November is the deadline for uh, proposal submission. Uh, we really want to make sure we have excellent proposals for last year. We had a really good bunch of proposals this year, including. Um, our uh, network featured lecture, which we are going to have shortly. Um, so invite each one of you who is part of the network. So um, the you know, 10 or 11 uh, active members in the steering committee, we would like for each of you to at least submit one and hopefully two sessions each on whatever is the topic of, of your interest. Um, and uh, hopefully we have a really nice mix of proposals that, did, that we can send forward. Um, I think I shared the good news with all of you this morning that we, um, thanks to um, all of our efforts, um, uh, won the network challenge. So part of that, uh, we actually get one extra network featured um, lecture next year. So uh, we kind of get a one for two special next year. And uh, hopefully, we have good proposals from, uh, from all of us. Um, that we can do justice to. Submission site is open only till November 30th, so we really are under the gun. There will be a telephone call next week, which Adele will be uh, uh, chairing, and uh, next Thursday. So Wednesday. 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 So uh, look for that in your in your emails. Um, the network challenge uh, again. We want to continue on with the good work that. We got the number one um, award, and uh, Dr. Sarani will be handing out envelopes. <laughs> uh, we want to make sure that we continue to be aggressive. Um, this is a great cause. The foundation is doing a lot of wonderful things for, uh, for our uh, college, for CHEST, a um, lot of educational outreach activities, and uh, certainly supporting a lot of we what we stand for and want to do. So certainly encourage all of you to reach into your uh, wallets and uh, try to keep our network at the forefront of um, the, the, uh, the network challenge. Um, if you don't mind, um, part of the award that we won today, we're going to receive a $50,000 grant to a, a project that we'll have to select as well, which is a great honor and a great resource that uh, we can uh, use uh, to serve our communities. So um, uh, please donate for continued uh, success uh, 
Um, there's also in your envelope at the bottom how you donate online um, using credit card. It's very quick, uh, straightforward process. Obviously, you'll get a letter. Um, this is, this was to uh, a charitable uh, foundation, so you get uh, tax uh, deduction. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, but uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, the current chair still, <laughs> uh, Dr. Subramanian, um, for his uh, leaving it on a high note and want to maintain that momentum. So uh, hopefully you guys uh, can contribute to our chest challenge for the, the third um, uh, round, um, next coming uh, third round. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Adele. Um, so with that, we uh, conclude the business aspect of um, the uh, operations network. I'll throw it open briefly for any comments uh, from any of the existing members. Um, and if there aren't any, then without further ado, I would like to move to the featured speaker session. Um, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Michael Bauman. Dr. Bauman is the past president, uh, 2013, of the American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, he's currently division chief medical officer of the Mountain Division of HCA, the Hospital Corporations of America. Uh, he has a CV that would take me about two hours to completely read out. Uh, prior to this, he was professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at the University of Mississippi. Uh, and he's going to address to us uh, a very, very important um, topic, which is, you know, show me the money. How do we get paid for the performance uh, that, we, uh, that, that we all hopefully put in, all the hard work that we put in? Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. Sounds like the election session that we are having, although the bad and the ugly part I get, I'm not sure. I think the good part is probably the fact it will all be over in, in three weeks. So, Dr. Bauman, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon. And uh, 4.30, at the end of the day, I'm surprised we've got this many people. <laughs> Plus, when you do a topic like this, it sometimes doesn't exactly excite people. I'm going to uh, take a little bit of water here. My wife is giving me the crud. Thank you very much to go home to the mountains. This is the mountain division. This is what I, uh, part of why I left lovely Mississippi. This is Grand Targhee Ski Area. The only way you can get there is through Idaho to Wyoming. And um, the fun part of this is it's got three runs called the good, the bad, and the ugly. And these are my kids and some of their friends. And you notice the black diamond. But what I really like is this movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And my favorite character is actually Clint Eastwood up here who has a very important saying, a good man knows his limitations. I do not ski Black Diamond. I'm too old and I'm not too stupid yet. I keep, uh, keep away from those ski areas. You're gonna see these characters occasionally again during this talk just to keep you awake. I actually thought, and I see Chad in the back here, we used to have this little meeting in Louisiana often called the Tri-State, and we'd have beer in the back of the room as a way to get people to hang around when it was this late in the day. You're gonna see some beer again here in a minute. So. Let's dispense with the conflicts of interest. Number one, I do work for Hospital Corporation of America. And uh, in the past, I've worked for Kaiser and I've worked for several university systems. Most recently, you heard the University of Mississippi. All of those, including every one of you in the room, depending upon what kind of practice you're in, brings a conflict to this conversation today. The fact that you're a doc should definitely bring a conflict of interest to this conversation. And you're gonna see in a bit this whole healthcare reform issue, you can't run away anymore. Uh, by the way, the opinions, this is the disclaimer, it's like working for the VA, these are not the opinions of HCA. But some of my opinions and comments are gonna be based on the fact that I work with 11 different hospitals, eight in Utah, two in Idaho, and I get to go to Alaska about six times a year because I have Alaska Regional Hospital. I have about uh, 1,700 beds that are, I'm playing with on the inpatient side, 125 acute ICU beds, which is interesting because the University of Mississippi had 90. So it was a bit of a step backwards. 
uh, and 157 ED beds, and depending upon how you count it, 2,000 physicians I'm working with. But those are mostly non-aligned, non-employed private practice docs. And it's very interesting to see where they're headed in this entire bit. And I have a lot of people to thank, but I'm not going to go through the list. I want you to look at the very bottom. Paradox. If you haven't gone to the CMS website, go to the CMS website. It's a bit like watching grass die. It's not exactly exciting, but if you guys are in practice operations or you have a practice operations person who's helping run your practice, go and learn. And it's actually, and I'm going to end the talk the last 10 minutes, and hopefully I don't put you to sleep, they are the web shots from last weekend. I had this talk all done, and what happened a week ago Friday? Does anybody know? The final rule came out, and you're going to hear today the final rule is not done. The final rule for the first time has a 90-day comment period. So what am I going to do in the next 30 minutes or so and keeping an eye on my watch? One, I'm going to give you a little bit of jargon around what is pay for performance. One of my favorite parts, I'm going to give you the history of reform. Everybody likes to call this Obamacare. And I gave a talk in a very conservative state, you can probably guess from the list where I came from, talking about, you know, in many ways what we're dealing with today, today could be called Bush care. And I'll show you why. I'm going to talk about health care today. Why are we in this mess? What's the driver? It's going to be statistics you won't like to hear about how well we rank internationally in the quality of our care. Then I'm going to end with MACRA and give you some screenshots to hopefully entice you to take the half hour to go there. Uh, no, I don't have a life. I spent four hours on the CMS website a week ago last Saturday because I have 2,000 docs I got to update and get on board with to teach them what's really out there. And then I'm going to give you a few conclusions. So semantics around, around pay for performance. But first, you're going to be subjected to what I call the Bauman bucket philosophy. And what is the Bauman bucket philosophy? Believe it or not, I use this quite frequently with my physicians. Right here, we have an ugly black cleaning bucket. This is bucket number one. This has got to do, must do. This is. CMS regulations. CMS drives joint commission. I happen to work for a corporation with 165 hospitals, the largest for-profit healthcare system in the world. I have to pay attention with corporate calls. What I'm trying to get docs to realize, do not waste your intellectual energy around bucket one. Use your intellectual energy to move forward and figure out with the resources you have, how do you tackle something like MACRA? Go to your ACCP, ATS, SCCM, and other organizations to do your battle for you, but get ready. Don't waste your time saying, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. That's OK. Be thinking about, how do I get it done? Some of life is bucket two. I told you I'd get beer into this talk. Here we have three Coronas, OK? It's something you're going to do. You're probably going to drink those three beers. Well, maybe not all three. But you do have some choices in bucket two. You can add more beer and you can add lime to it. But this is something you're usually told you're going to do and you have more input. Bucket three is the bottle of champagne. Bucket three is local improvement projects that you're excited about, that you want to do, that you have control over. The reality in life is this is what my personal experience is. I have absolutely no data to support it, other than particularly the last two years, is about 70% of what I deal with is bucket one. And this is why I came up with the bucket philosophy. We can move forward and be more impactful for physicians and have more time to have fun if we don't argue about things we're not going to win the battle about. So Winston Churchill did that in about 30 seconds, saying, sometimes it's not enough to do our best. We must do what is required. Nobody likes that, but it's part of what we're dealing with today. And what I want to do is give you the tools to do what's required and not make it quite so onerous and give you what you need to know. So now the terminology. Pay for performance is a lot more than value-based purchasing, but a lot of people think about value-based purchasing as one and the same. And so I'm going to walk you through this so you can be more educated when you're hearing about all these terms 
so you know what to tackle and what may be impacting you. Keep in mind, there are two different really important things in play. Statute. This is Congress passing a statute. On the right-hand side of the slide is CMS taking that and implementing it. So statute and regulation. So at the top, what's the percentage of reimbursement tied to these programs? CMS then says, what are the actual measures in each program? Don't get mixed up because if you decide to tackle this as a society like ACCP or CHEST, you got to know where to go, and where to go isn't legislation. It's actually CMS to work with them. So here's the summary of what we have on our plate. And again, most of this is inpatient. And again, macro, we'll get into it, is really Part B Medicare. And it's anywhere inpatient and outpatient. Value-based purchasing actually encompasses hospital-acquired conditions. There's overlap with the readmission reduction program. And under there is MSPB, which is Medicare spending per beneficiary. But notice a big chunk of this is so-called value-based purchasing, but all of it is pay for performance. Yes, a lot of it has been focused on hospitals. Get ready, guys. It's really now coming down as a microscope more and more on you. But it's always changing focus. Let me show you just the next couple of slides. Fiscal year 2013. I love how they screw with dates. Federal fiscal year is October of 2012 to September of 2013. Don't worry about that. What I want you to see is it started out about patient experience and core measures. Then we started with outcomes, really mortality and complications, CLABSI and CAUTI. Here comes 2015, and we add a little bit more around efficiency. That's Medicare spending per beneficiary. By the way, it's all being tracked by physicians. Then we get to 2016, which was really finished up here recently. And notice what's changing. Core measures is becoming less and less important. What we're moving toward is more around the whole idea of outcomes, OK? Then we get to this year. Notice core measures are almost nothing now. It's really almost equally weighted by everything else. That's a bit what macro is going to look like, because a lot of the things you can do in macro are buried in here, too. Okay, So we're changing our focus, and we're moving to how efficient is the facility? How efficient are you as a physician? What's your patient experience? And this isn't making a patient happy. It's the overall experience, patient safety, and outcomes. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is in that realm in the next little bit. Macro is inpatient and outpatient. So this is the part that tends to get me in trouble. Because I like to tell people, this is not just some fait accompli that's called Obamacare. We got here through multiple administrations, both Republican and otherwise. And then I'm going to show you a little bit about sepsis, my experience in 11 hospitals with sepsis by getting on board early and not waiting for CMS to come and hit us with it. Is there politics in healthcare? You heard the you know, comments earlier. I cannot wait for November 8th to be done. My wife won't even turn on the TV. She doesn't want to hear all the arguing, much less the interesting stories. But is healthcare reform driven by one party? Everybody thinks, I mean, the Democrats take a pacing. I'll put it on the table. I took a year off and went and studied healthcare and healthcare systems back in 2013. I went up somewhat conservative, came back very liberal when it came to healthcare. And you'll see some of the numbers of what changed me. This is neither party. So if you want to hear a little bit about this, read a little bit more about it, rather, go and read this article by Mark Chasson, who's the current chair and, and president of Joint Commission. And the CMS website has more than you could ever want to read, but I'm going to summarize it for you. This really started in 1965 with Lyndon Johnson, with Medicare. And why was Medicare started? It wasn't altruistic. It was all about just getting access to care. There was no focus on quality of care, although they were smart enough to go to know this, and my dad was one of the problems. My gosh, here's this gold mine. Utilization review was put in right up front because they figured out docs are smart little white creatures that go through mazes. We're going to figure out how to use this. Then in the Republican administration that followed after that, we developed the 
Professional Standards Review Organization. At that time, think 1972, 170 million dollars was put toward monitoring ourselves. Docs were put in charge of this. For some reason, AMA didn't like this, but this is really the beginning of the whole utilization review and performance metrics that we started to be measured by. Not a whole lot under Carter and Ford, but then under Ronald Reagan, we get one of the biggest changes we've ever had for us in healthcare, which was DRGs. DRGs. So you've seen Democrat, Republican, Republican, and then under this was also more about peer review and the QIOs that still exist today. Under Ronald Reagan also, Joint Commission started requiring evidence-based care documentation. Okay? Medicare basically deems Joint Commission to do this stuff, and at the same time, something that became known as the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality started supporting guidelines. Why is that important? Where do you think all these performance measures pretty much came from? They came from AHRQ. Some of the largest guidelines out there were published, and we used to partner at uh, CHEST with this group. Mark Matursky, I think he's left, but you know, we t did a whole lot of work with AHRQ, spending on average $300,000 per guideline, not us, them helping us develop guidelines, that two big guidelines have been turned into performance measures. Then we get Bill Clinton. The red asterisk is the health care reform that failed, but what didn't fail that came through was HIPAA. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Buried in that is not just insurance, and portability, it's fraud and abuse, and measurement against fraud and abuse. It's the beginning of us being monitored even more closely, not just hospitals, but docs. Also came two IOM reports, and one was crossing the quality chasm. You've all heard the line. Between the health care we have and what we could have is not just a gap, but a chasm. That was supplemented the same year by the patient safety report called to air as human, and one year later, the same data came out, and it was called the patient safety report. Same exact findings. We were killing around 100,000 people per year in hospitals. By the way, USA Today and US News and World Reports redid this last year. We haven't made a whole lot of progress. I put that in here because that's when I got brainwashed. I left for a year and uh, went to Dartmouth and got a, a, an extra little set of letters behind my name, and it was all around systems and systems improvement. At the same time, under Clinton became the first shot at public reporting, which was health grades. Then came Bush, two big bits of legislation during the Bush, Bush years. Number one, Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement Modernization Act. This actually put the entire framework, this was a seminal event for Bush. He pushed this about quality reporting systems. Underneath this was also meaningful use, okay? Uh, my whole point of showing this, this has really been a bipartisan process. Both sides of the aisles, both presidents have moved this forward, both you know, Republican and Democrat. It also laid the entire framework for inpatient reporting for the ACA. Next came the Deficit Reduction Act, and this is really cool language in here, and yeah, this kind of stuff interests me because i got to be able to tell the story. This is all about Medicaid expansion under George Bush. It's all the language around how can Medicaid look like commercial insurance. What do we have now? Medicaid expansion has primarily gone forward, not always successfully, with using commercial insurance products. Next, at the end of the Bush era, we got an amazing report just as he left the presidency. CMS, with direction from Congress, those two acts, has begun to transform itself from a passive payer of services into an active purchaser of high quality, notice that interesting term, affordable care, Affordable Care Act. So, I threw the little underscore there because I got the pleasure of going to NQF uh, for chest and heard both the McCain camp and the, and the uh, Obama camp. Their health care policy reform framework was almost identical. Granted, the details were different. 
we knew because of the burn rate in dollars, whoever became president, we were on major collision course about health care in the U.S. At the same time under Bush, we got the first hospital compare reports, major event. Also, not unique to Bush, from 2007 to 2009 fiscal year, Medicare costs were skyrocketing and losses were becoming just amazing. This was the dollar burn rate that we were talking about. What did we get? We got the Affordable Care Act. And it was not, yes, it's Obama, no argument. And there are things that would have been different with the Republican Party, but we got an Affordable Care Act. Also, one year later, what did we get? Physician Compare. So this is just a 10-minute summary of how we got where we are today to show you that this is not, it's politics, but it's both sides of the aisle. But it's interesting to see where we are and how we got there. So, what's the core to all of this? The core to all of this is performance measures, okay? You've heard all, you know, there's COPD bundles, there's sepsis bundles. People argue, are they loosely or tightly coupled with driving outcome? I want to show you a little bit about sepsis. So HCA, one of the reasons, in addition to the mountains, and my family, by the way, lives an hour away from that picture at the beginning, got lured out to the mountains, but HCA took a very forward-thinking approach to a lot of this. They already had a CMS-like bundle in place when I got there. They were already looking at fluid resuscitation, measuring lactates and sorting patients, timely admission of antibiotics, and driving outcomes. And you know how started it? Everybody heard of a CF no? It's kind of like a CFO. The CFO of one of the two major groups in HCA said, I'm looking at your mortality stats around sepsis, and they stink. We're going to do something. A finance guy drove this. So what I want you to see is, number one, I came on in August of 2014, and we had some areas that weren't playing ball. That's the nicest way I can say it. But right now, and this was for a report we did to Corpus in 2016, notice our septic shock and severe sepsis mortality rates. They're pretty good. They're pretty astounding. What drove that was bundle compliance shown right here. And we've upped the game and said, we're not going to do 50%. We're going to do 60%. And the best part about this was a lot of the components, and you can argue about the horrendous way CMS did this, the level of detail is excruciatingly painful, but it put us in a good place to not only do patient care that we needed to, but also prepare better than most for dealing with CMS. But that was all around what are the right performance measures. And at the end of the day, between 2015 and 2014, uh, doing some back of the napkin calculations, we actually saved, we estimate, 92 lives. We wouldn't have saved across 11 hospitals if we hadn't have done that. So it was pretty rewarding to see that. So healthcare today, the why behind the what. What is really driving this? And no, I don't have my eyes shut. Money, money, money for CMS, okay? But they really do have a big focus on quality as well. So I'm going to give you some of what the quality problems in the U.S. are right now that maybe you don't want to think about. So there are three kinds of lies. And I love Mark Twain. He supposedly said this, but it's argued. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. It's one of, uh, uh, there's a woman I used to work with called Marcy Petrini who's really cool. She loved to talk about statistics. And hopefully these statistics aren't damn lies, but I bet they're pretty damn straight. So, the Commonwealth Fund published this one year ago, and there are lots of similar publications, but I want to wake you up at why we're being beaten over the head about this. And it came from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they looked at 13 industrialized high-income countries. You can see them here. And what did we find? Well, number one, we outspend every other one of those countries, and the next closest country 50% less than us is France. And we're also the only country without so-called universal health care. Now, let me argue that point. CMS 
pays for two-thirds of the health care in this country right now, two-thirds. But it's not well organized. And if we look at the tax breaks that we give folks, businesses, to pay for our health care, that's another $200 billion. We just aren't organized. We're fragmented. So, Mississippi. I used to live there. I have to be careful now. I don't live there anymore. It's kind of like the token third world country within our own country. It's first in everything you don't want to be. Teen pregnancies, obesity, sexually transmitted diseases. It's last in things like education. So of course the statistics I'm going to show you really are only about Mississippi, right? No. I see it across the areas I now work very closely with, and I've been in other parts of the country. So these stats may astound you, and no, they're not about Mississippi or Alabama or those poor states in the deep, deep, deep south. They're about the U.S. as a whole. So look at the yellow bar at the bottom left. The U.S. has the lowest life expectancy, highest infant mortality, percentage of chronic health conditions including COPD, hypertension, we are one of the most obese nations in the country. And you want to know what the most obese state is? One guess. Oh, come on. I just gave it to you. It's Mississippi. So I lived in the most obese portion of the world because the US is the most obese nation. Other than Mexico, three years ago, they got the honor. So we rather have a large population in Mississippi. So. What's America's health like? OK? And the Institute of Medicine in the same article had this great quote. Poor health in the United States is not simply the result of economic, social, or racial and ethnic disadvantages. Even well-off, non-smoking, non-obese Americans appear in worse health than their counterparts. There's a whole other lecture on what we're doing, and it has to do with overuse of technology, overuse of testing, bias in testing. There's a whole lot of things we do because we can. The question is, should we? So it's an interesting discussion. I don't know about you. I'm not sure whether to say health care is bad, but it certainly is not good when I compare it to the 13 other industrialized nations that were in that study. So what this has led to is a whole lot of health care reform. And the most recent shot is October 14th, 2015, the final rule on MACRA. So in the last five to 10 minutes, I'm going to walk you through MACRA. First, I want to ask, anybody part of an APM? One person, two people. So I guess that was the case, and the stats would support it. You're going to hear mostly about something called MIPS. And I'm going to show you that even CMS has a prejudice in favor of MIPS, because when you click through it, they keep driving you to MIPS. So let me walk you through what MACRA is. Do you think any of this is going to change with the election, first and foremost? No. It would be a hell of a miracle if Donald Trump unwound all this if he became president. There's too much in here. He's got a, a, an interesting view on this that's Interesting. I'm not happy with either one. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> I don't want to get into more trouble. So what happened? Everybody here knows about SGR, right? It's OK if you don't. SGR has been out there since 1997. It was basically based on how did we do economically every year. Well, we know what happened in the mid-2000s. We didn't do so well. We were not getting sustainable growth weight increases. They were either no increase or minimal increases, and it kept getting kicked down the road. There were 17 fixes along the way that weren't fixes. So in April of 2015, they came up with MACRA, which is Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. I love all the acronyms. It's almost like being a cardiologist. They got more interesting acronyms for every study. So good thing SGR was repealed. The really ugly thing is we got MACRA. But MACRA, and I'm not completely brain dead, actually has a lot of flexibility in it. And it offers you options if you will learn the rules. This is another bucket one. Learn the rules, and you can play pretty well. So 
I throw this timeline up here to show you it's in flux. I played with this. I stole some of these from, from our consultant, which is the advisory board. Today, notice October 14th, it came out. They're still not done. So when I get to a part that I stole from Mike Nelson, thank you, Mike Nelson, that's got all the numbers, I'm not going to go through the numbers. The numbers are changing. There's more coming out in January, and they got a 90-day comment period. So this is the latest. Some of this will change. I woke up Saturday morning, October the 15th, and went, crap, i got to change my lecture. Sorry. But this was what was there, what I found entertaining in the Salt Lake Tribune. It was right next to the uh, advertisement for Jekyll and Hyde. And I went, well, this is a little bit like macro. But it wasn't a bad day. I sat down and went through this and went, actually not a lot changed. And they did clean up a bit. So what is macro? It's taking three things that you are already or should already have been working with. One is PQRS, more of an outpatient focus. The other was value-based payment modifier that barely got birthed and we're going to cancel it. And the last one was EHR, basically meaningful use and your use of the electronic health record. How many of you actually have a certified EHR in your office? Okay, good. Mississippi is interesting. They're still struggling. My wife worked for someone who refuses to get an EHR in a dermatology clinic. And she said, I'll just retire, and she can't. She's at that stage. If you're one of the people who didn't raise your hand, start looking for a certified EHR. You really can make a difference. In MACRA, it will pay you to do so. So the jargon, MIPS, two main pathways. Merit-based incentive payments, roughly 500,000 folks are eligible starting January 1. And it's not just docs, I'll show you in a minute. Advanced alternative payment models that I'm just going to call APMs. Here's some numbers. Only about 70 to 120,000 clinicians are going to get it. I'll give a little bit more. And the big suck there, the draw, is a 5% bonus. But it's incredibly complicated. Incredibly complicated. Interestingly, starting at the bottom of the slide, in 2019, non-Medicare payments will be eligible under APMs. So you, you cannot just deal with this with Medicare. There will be certain other aspects in play. Who's in the quality payment program? These slides, from henceforth, some of it I stripped right out of the executive summaries and off the website. Notice all the people, physicians, physician assistants, all the way to CRNAs. They did change some of this. And notice the focus on MIPS at the top. It used to be $10,000 in Medicare payments. They upped it to 30. So that got rid of some more folks and 100 Medicare patients per year. This excludes 30% of Medicare clinicians today. What I want you to think about, think pathology, those kind of docs. But notice, only 5% of Medicare Part B spending. Translate that, 95% of Medicare Part B spending, physicians are in there and their payments are in there, are still in play, which means most of you are in play. Looking at MIPS, approximately 750,000 physicians are excluded at this point. You'll get sucked in eventually. Of those, roughly 200,000 of those 750 have to do with low volume issues. At the bottom, some of it is also the people that can play in APMs, and it's only about 120,000 physicians. Why did I put this in here? If you're not playing yet, you will be playing. Take the time to start and play early and get good at the game so you don't get hurt in the game. So I beat it to death. Get on the train. Don't be the guy on the tracks. This is bucket one. Take the time. In four hours, you can go through that website. It goes four hours. I did it because I wanted to update the lecture. You can go through in an hour and really see some cool stuff, and that's what about what I'm about to show you. This is a basic pattern right here. You have a performance year, and then you go down and you get an adjustment year. This is probably going to be the way it is. And this is the way it is for hospitals. The performance year is 2017. You can submit your data as late as March of 2018. 
Then you get feedback on how well it was submitted, did you have errors, and then your adjustment comes. They're going to compress this timeline, by the way. This timeline is pretty long when you think about it. So one of the changes is how to compress the timeline. You really have four choices right now. On the bottom, number four is APMs. I'm not even going to go there. Upper left, I didn't number it. I hope you don't go there. I'm not going to do anything. Up front, you can lose 4% of your payments starting in 2019 if you don't play. One, two, and three are different levels of engagement. And this is something they changed. They're trying to get people in, including small practices that they thought were being excluded. For a minimum of 90 days of data, and you'll see a couple areas I'll point out, you can actually get probably no penalty or a slight bump if you'll just play for 90 days. If you'll just play for 90 days. Or if you just submit something, you won't get hurt. So there really is a way to bring you in. So I'm going to focus on the big picture here and give you some of the detail. What I found interesting is read the bottom. Page 14 of the executive summary, I found it fun. I found it elsewhere. But I found six instances of we're still finalizing this. So you're getting a bit of a half-baked picture so far. This is courtesy of Mike. Here are the numbers. I went and corrected the numbers. The August edition of Chess Physician has this in it. It's a good, nice little summary. But there's some numbers that are wrong that are now correct here. Quality, 60% now, used to be 50% because resource use, translate how efficient you are, will not be included. But they will give you the numbers and give you feedback. Advancing care information is basically meaningful use at 25%. Clinical practice improvement is 15%. APMs are here. Big issue is the 5%. This is all available for you. By the way, I uploaded all of this on the website if you want to pull it down with the references. APM, this is where I dismiss it for a bit. Be done with it here and then focus on MIPS pretty much, except for one more slide. Two steps to get into a MIPS, and they're not easy lifts. One, two, and three on the left side of the slide are all about risk. Risk. This is all about risk sharing. All docs here is I'm going to get a 5% up. This comes with risk. You got to know how to play. You also have to have a certified EHR. And on the right side of the slide, it's all about minimum thresholds either in percent of revenue or number of patients seen. OK? So that's APMs. And actually, I think APMs, I spent a day with CMS in Salt Lake. They came to talk. They're still playing with what are the right APMs. So it's a very changing area. It's interesting, and there's a lot of good stuff there. What I want you to pay attention to, at best, 12% of physicians are going to be in APMs and be eligible to be in an APM in 2017. On the right-hand side, focus right-hand side. I want you to see the barometer of how hard they are. Then go to the left-hand side. It's quality, resource use, clinical practice improvement, and EHR. Now go back to the right-hand side. The top two, quality and resource use, are peer comparisons. It's harder to do. The bottom half, take-home message, clinical practice improvement, it's like Anybody here having the fun of doing maintenance of certification? You get credit for doing some pretty basic things. Very bottom, meaningful use, there's some pretty basic things you can do. And actually, they are easier, and you get credit. If you haven't started, that's where I would start. It's messy. It's really messy. So CMS actually did something good. They tried to get you to figure it out. And what did they do? Go to this landing page. Here's the site in the handout, and you're going to take you right here to learn about the program. It brings this up. It explains to you that resource use isn't really going to hit until 2018, although they'll collect your data. 2017 is a transition year. 2018 will be a transition year in all likelihood as well. APMs, they brush through quickly. And I want you to see, here's the tab I started with. Here's where I'm going. And this is. What can I do now? You can't read it, but it says, what can I do now? 
this is pretty much all they have on APMs. They tell you what they are, they're very limited, and then they take you to what can I do now, and what do they say? MIPS. And you can join MIPS, reporting as an individual or as a group. If you're part of a group, you can still report as an individual. Really, you just have to have a certified EHR. I wish we had gone ahead and chest and done our uh, database, because we were close to getting a qualified database for bronchoscopy. And then also look at how you submit data. It's pretty clean. You can go in here and find it. And then they give you this big overview. And then you click in, and I'm going to end with six slides, seven slides. Quality, same caveats. You can report less than six measures, less than six measures. You can get away with a 90-day minimum, remember. If you are using a group interface, you've got to report 15 for the year if you have up to 15 that, that actually work, and you have to have at least one outcome measure or one high-priority measure. I'm going to show you what that means in a second. You click into it, and this is where they did something very good for you. This is just clicking along. I'm, this is exactly what I saw. It gives you 271 quality measure choices. I was bored. I read all 271. <laughs> I went through. I looked at it. And the rest of the slides are going to be about what would work for pulmonary critical care or sleep. I went through and I found 48 of these that actually are pretty reasonable for pulmonary. And I downloaded the Excel spreadsheet. And that's what it looks like. And it gives measure name description. Is it an e-measure, high priority or not, data submission method? We could talk about that. If it's an e-measure and your hospital's building it, you're golden. Examples, adult sinusitis, antibiotic use or overuse. Avoid antibiotics and acute bronchitis. Biopsy follow-up. I hope everybody in this room still does bronx. I have to admit, I haven't done one in two years. I went to the dark side and I gave up clinical practice. COPD, long-acting bronchodilators, COPD spirometry evaluation, optimal asthma control. That was just a quick look. You can really dig in, and these are things that you probably do as part of your daily work. Advanced care information. This is the meaning, meaningful use part. They screwed this site up. Just so you know, they screwed the site up. I'm waiting just as a game to see how long it takes them to fix it. Really, there are only supposed to be five required measures listed right here that are pretty easy. You can do some more for bonus, but on the website, you go down and you actually find some additional information, which is shown right here. These 11 measures should have only been the five measures, so they're going to confuse some people. Okay, Up here are the ones you can do for bonus points. And just within those, if you go backwards, if I can make this slide deck go backwards, there we go. Dup, dup, dup. These five are pretty e easy. Security risk analysis, provider patient access, e-prescribing. You should be doing most of this. Send a summary of care. Request and accept a summary of care. This gets you 50% of the points you can get out of here. Okay, and these are bonus points, and the best part, the reason I went backwards, these bonus points are also found improvement activities. There's overlap. If you do it for one, you get double credit. In the improvement activities, think maintenance of certification. These are chip shops. If you're already doing something, you can probably do these. They made it a little bit easier. You're down from six medium and three high weight to four medium and two high weight. Remember, you can do it for 90 days. They're break, giving a break for smaller practices and rural practices. And as I said, you get some overlap with EHR. And out of this, when I looked at it, when you go here and download the measures, 40 appear really easy things to do when you look at them. You can put it together in your office. Anticoagulation management. You can partner with your pharmacy group if you have a coag clinic. Antibiotic stewardship, you can actually be a part of that and be a part of your hospital's program, which is a requirement for 27, 2017 for Joint Commission. Tobacco use cessation programs, everybody got one? Yeah. Telehealth to expand a practice. I'm doing a bunch of telehealth initiatives, not me personally, but working with our group on telehealth. So there really are some easy things that you can do. 
It ends with a warning. You gotta read all the way to the end of the executive summary. This will be posted in Physician Compare. So up to date, how is Medicare gonna do attribution to individual physicians? It's a mess out of hospital care. So this is their way of finally getting physicians into Physician Compare. This is where that's gonna finally come back and be a part of your life. So, conclusions, take home. Well, pay for performance is really not just Obamacare. It's, a, it's part of a continuum. And there really are some acceptable measures out there. We can argue about them, but I really, you know, sepsis is a mess, but at the core, it's got good measures. U.S. spends more on health care than all other industrialized countries, but with poorer outcomes. A whole lot of reasons, but that's why we're being scrutinized. SGR out, macro in, I would say go with MIPS, unless you're one of the lucky people that are part of an APM. And last but not least, as boring, as boring, as boring as it is, go to the CMS website, carve out one hour, go to the landing page and see what's out there. And I'll thank the team I work with at home, and I'll end with, please don't be like this, okay? Be like these guys. That, that ostrich seemed to have a smile on his face. And with that, I'll uh, take all the shots that you want to have at me. Thanks for the attention. Okay. Yes? Thanks for the great talk. You know, one of the things is that the CMS chair came in and they said, like, all this mecca rules and all the regulations coming in, their purpose is never to get the solo physician or a small practice is out of the practice. But what is your take on that all those rules coming in? Is it practical and applicable for the smaller practice or solo physician is provided? So two part answer there. Andy Slavitt has a whole section and he's been talking a lot. So for the prior two weeks he's been talking up how they're gonna help smaller practices. And so there really were some changes theoretically to help smaller practices. Uh, so I did spend 20 years in Mississippi, and there's some really small practices in rural areas. It's really hard when you're trying to just take care of patients every day to do something like this, even as a small practice. So I think even though they made some of the measures easier for people to contend with, made the process easier to contend with, the reality is you want to just take care of patients. It's tough. So many of those docs are looking to move to an employment model. And that's why I think smaller practices are still going to get hit with this. But I have to give them credit. They really did look at different requirements for smaller practices in rural health. It's all in there, you know, trying to stick to 35 minutes or so. I didn't put all that in there. They really made some changes. But then you go over here and go, you got a guy as part of a three-part practice in middle of nowhere, Mississippi. What are they really going to do? Who's going to do this? Do they have the money to actually sit down and do it? Uh, have they really invested in EHR, even though there are subsidies, subsidies to do that? It just makes it tough. I think they made an honest effort. I don't think their intention is to get rid of small practices. I also think if you look at the other part of government, we've been subsidizing people to go to rural health for years. But by nature, a lot of those are small practices. They don't want to kill them. They're going to have to figure out a way to subsidize this and help them. And there are some subsidies out there. So reality, I think it's going to drive more people to the employed model. Mark, and then we'll move forward. Thank you. Mike, great talk. Um, two questions, potentially related. One is, um, do you decide on the measures, do you have to decide on the measures before 2017 or as 2017 starting, or can you just wait? So March 2018, see where you've done well, and then report. Um, no, and I'm going to go back. Oh, uh, hang on. There's stuff in here that's buried. I always come with about 5,000 slides. So what I wanted to show you here, I'm just going back to this. You really have to start to play in 2017. You don't have to. You don't have to report until March of 2018. So if you've got a sense of what you're doing great. But you have to start playing in 2017. Now, so ahead of time. yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's where I'm headed. And that's, you know, if you were already playing in PQRS, 
you kind of know what you were good at, but what I looked at is, let's say you've never been playing. So I looked at it as, I've never been playing. How quickly can I get a tobacco program up? How quickly could I partner with somebody around coagulation management? Things like that. And, and sort of the follow-up to that is, if you're practicing, or if you're a leader like you are in a large organization as opposed to a small practice, how top-down do you, do you make the process of figuring out which measures to report on versus how much do you let the individual, you know, specialties or subspecialties decide on their own measure? How, how are you implementing that? So that depends upon your employment model. So HCA, I wish I'd, and actually I had buried the mission in here and I took it out. It's interesting. Um, HCA is not very interested in employing physicians. It employs very select groups like cardiologists when you know the cath lab world crashed and they were looking for an escape hatch. So most of our physicians are independent physicians. Most of our focus is, our focus is on inpatient care. It's an inpatient industry that's now moving outpatient over the last two years. But having no physicians on whole employed, a very small percentage, that's not our focus. So let me change it and put it to where you're going. Let's do university where you're at. You probably need to be relatively prescriptive and having watched your data so far and hopefully you've been participating in PQRS or if you're in a private practice with a fairly large group and they've got numbers of who's in and who's out, you should know what you're good at already. And if you haven't been playing, you should have probably a reasonable sense of what you're good at or can get good at very quickly. That's why I spent all that time on the website to figure out what's easy to do now. To answer your question directly, if you've got an employed model like University of Mississippi, you can be pretty prescriptive, but be sensitive to the docs, knowledge about what they think they're good at and work with them and come up with a model to do. If you're a large group practice, same thing. The group should be going, what can we do? You're going to have to play, you know. So it, it's for us in HCA, I have a very small group. It's called Physician Services Group that employs docs. The vast majority of my docs are in practice, but what I want to do is help them understand this is coming because if I had unhappy docs, they're not going to be, a, they're not going to be happy in the hospital either. So I want to help them understand how to do this. So does that get to it, part two? You had two parts? Yeah, next, in blue. Yeah. Um, that was really good. Thanks for taking four hours and boiling it down. No, no, it was self-serving self because I have to know this for, this is a twofer. This is for home and for here. Right. And with this, I would have to estimate that would be interested in your opinion that this is going to drive that even higher. And when you get down to it, the question that I have for you is, you said this is all about money, but at what point in time do you cross over where the amount that we're spending on quality reporting actually is not being seen in patient care and quality outcomes? So it's the yin and the yang. So I'm not Having worked with some of the people in CMS, Mark's worked with some of the people in CMS, the burn rate, they want to survive. So I'm going to get to a, a point here. So even though I said a lot of this is about money, there are many, many, many people in CMS that actually want better quality for what we're spending. That's the term value. But the reality is money is a major driver because it's going to dry up if we don't more efficiently use the money we have. So number one, it isn't just about money, but money is the driver because the burn rate, you know, the estimates are we're one in five dollars in 2020 is going to be on health care, and with two-thirds of it being spent by Medicare, it's a big issue. So back to your issue. How are we going to solve that problem? Yeah, we're going to get to a tipping point where we're spending way too much money on you know, abstracting data. So data abstraction I spend a lot of time with. They don't work for me, but I work with them every week trying to figure out where we screw up. That's the whole purpose of e-measures. 
That is the whole purpose of e-measures. And I wish I'd put it in here. Um, there is just a whole suite of e-measures coming. So VTE and stroke are now pretty much e-measures, OK? Uh, and I'm tracking them. We're doing very well with, with VTE around prophylaxis for non-ICU and ICU patients. But it's now all, is it in the medical record? And the key is getting your docs to recognize if they want the credit for the work they do and the hospital have the credit for the work they do, they better play in the EHR the way it was intended to be used. We often have taken the EHR to match our, match our processes, which are often broken instead of something like Epic that comes with a pretty good process, but hell, it doesn't match my practice. I'm going to just take it and screw it up. That's where we need to help as docs is to learn in that EHR and use it more efficiently so we don't reach that tipping point because it's coming our way. All of that said, we're spending a huge amount of money. So in my old job in Mississippi, I had 40 reports, 45 reports. Uh, one of them was performance improvement, and five of those were abstractors. Five. It's a huge number of people just sitting there cranking out numbers to the University Health System Consortium, who was our intermediary. That's the problem. And the solution is e-measures. And we just have to play as docs to do better. So I know that's a little bit long-winded. but the, the core is we got to move to e-measures and be good at it as much as we have the world's worst. I think I'm being recorded. EHR called Meditech. It's awful, awful, but we're making it work. So you had a question. Yeah, to follow up on Mark's question, so in that context of the large multi-specialty practice, right. um, you know, under PQRS, you could basically submit your best measures, and if it applied to only, you know, 20% of the docs, those 20% sort of were the shield for the rest of the practice. Right. Can you still do that with the new macro rules? You know, I don't have an answer to that. I'd have to go dig into the detail. It's funny that the, the, fe the final rule is 2,204 pages long, and macro composes a huge part of it. And no, I didn't go, I wasn't that much of an idiot. I didn't dig through the, the fine print. So I don't have that answer. But there is, in the language in the executive summary, which I read closely along with a bunch of stuff from a very good group, the and I'm not touting the advisory board. They did a quick summary. They were out in August and did a summary. Then their guy knew I was doing this lecture. He sent me a summary on Sunday morning. It was like, OK. But that wasn't in there. But I get the sense you can report as a group. And it states that clearly. Remember, as an individual, as a group, you can report as a group. So I'm betting because they're trying to stick with some of the main framework of PQRS and the EHR meaningful use, that some of the rules will be the same. But I got to read the fine print to give you a real answer or a correct answer. Celine. Yeah, you know, one of the things is that it's kind of a devil's advocate. Most of the reporting, when it goes to the outpatient, you know, if you take a pulmonary critical care, a lot of the folks feel it's much easier revenue based in the hospital side with the ACA and other. Whether you do the ICU, your 90% of the revenue comes from the inpatient with $0 overhead. Whereas when you take the 10% revenue from the outpatient, where your overhead is about 60% or 70%. So the question is, when you put the rules more, is it going to affect the ACO model? Because ACA typically doesn't operate outpatient practices. Yeah. So for HCA, we have avoided ACOs. Um, a lot of reasons. Uh, we've also avoid, avoided risk models. Uh, we're big enough to sit and watch and see how the market evolves. And that's been the stance to watch how the market evolves. But we have started getting more in the outpatient business with purchasing um, urgent cares. Took me a minute to get there. Urgent cares. But you're right, that's part of the issue. Take it out of HCA, put it in a general practice. Remember, Part B Medicare is how docs get paid. So a pulmonary guy and, or a critical care guy, I was looking at how would a critical care guy get into this. There are measures that critical care can play. So Joint Commission requires any, I'm just, we did uh, nine, nine Joint Commission surveys this year. So, so Joint Commission requires 
you know, uh, a whole lot around patient safety and anticoagulation. There's a bunch of models you can hook onto as an inpatient for your improvement project. So there are inpatient things for inpatient docs that don't spend a lot of their life in the outpatient world. And yes, PQRS is mostly outpatient, but it's for physician payment, profies, doesn't matter inpatient or outpatient. Do you see the physician is stopping the outpatient practice completely and then just doing patient in the critical care area? I would call that hospitalist. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the hospitalist movement. I mean, why did I do internal medicine as a stepping stone to do pulmonary and critical care? I did not like outpatient. I, I, I don't like the walking worried well. I want to take care of really sick patients or in my pulmonary clinic, I'm revealing my, well, the way I think. I love my asthma, COPD, and sarcoid in my plural cases, you know, but I did not, I, I had to spend two and a half years in Kaiser doing hemorrhoids, hangnails, and hypertension. It darn near killed me. I, I, so there are people who love outpatient care and God bless them because we need them, but the system is driving them from outpatient to inpatient in a lot of ways. Yes? As, as a follow-up to the question on the employee model, so I was talking to a lot of fellows who have been just out of training and who are increasingly being employed by larger organizations. Uh, there's a sense of complacency that these things will come down to them from their employer mm -hmm. and that they don't really need to get into the nitty-gritty of understanding a lot of these things and so just wanted your perspective on how is that more of an illusion on their part or is this something that they that eventually they will pretty much have to get up to speed on and so they don't necessarily have to be too proactive uh, in sort of yeah I think it's it, it, it's both um, uh, Mark asked the question I think it was about driving people away you know, small practices, I can't remember who asked that question. People want to be employed because they don't want to deal with the management, the administrative parts of this. And I get that. I'd rather, you know, although I transitioned to a different world, when I was in the ICU, I just wanted to take care of the ICU. You know, don't bug me with some of this other stuff. And that's okay, but do you balance your checkbook the same way? This is about your checkbook. You really got to understand funds flow of your life. And do you want to leave it to one of those administrators who may not be a doc, who doesn't really care what happens. They're just trying to get the stuff done. That's why I went into what I do. I like working with the docs. So you really should learn it. Do you have to know it to the nth degree? No, but you have to know the language to ask the right questions. So yeah, it's great to join a practice, be employed, and there's a huge movement, roughly 40% of physicians in the U.S. right now are an employed model, and you really need to move and understand that that doesn't shield you from the responsibility of understanding what's going to happen in your life. So that's a philosophy of mine. And some practices may just say, hey, this is what we're going to do, which was asked over there, which to a degree is okay, but you ought to really have an interest in what's happening to your money. And you don't have to go spend, I do this because I have an interest and I have a job that looks at this. But you ought to spend an hour or two one day on the CMS website and learn about what's going to happen to you and why people are asking you the questions and make sure because administrators make mistakes every day. Yes, sir. October <laughs> 14, and I realized it was released because everybody thought it was November 1st. I have two questions. So, did I get it right? Or at least in the ballpark? We both on the same boat. <laughs> both using the same website. <laughs> We're both equally confused. Um, two questions. One is regarding the, uh, the quality measures. Um, I looked at the PQRS. We talked mm -hmm. about the PQRS. I'm an intensivist, and I'm looking at critical care as well. There's not nothing related to critical care or specific to critical care. Yes, there is some, some collapsy um, reporting which is uh, global, it's not unique right. to critical care. I uh, went to the uh, website, the quality measures and uh, PPP and the measures. Right. It's a nice, actually, you know what, interactive site and you can sort by specialty. 
Right. Nothing listed on the pulmonary, critical care, sleep, intensive care, nothing. There is no grouping of right. measures by the So I went through and looked at what could be used thinking about what you did. I did it as, I think, all right, I'm thinking, I'm not a sleep doctor. Thank God Nancy Collip covered that for me. <laughs> it's like sleep, only sleep I care about is my own. <laughs> or send them to a sleep specialist. So what I'm heading to is right here. So quality, right here. What I looked at, you can dig through there. There was more in there that you could look at and go, hmm, how could I change that in a way that might fit ICU? Never do biopsies in the ICU. So I was literally looking at what happens in the ICU. So also look at the minimum requirements back here. Less than six measures, really, if you can find them that apply. So I was looking for the loopholes. And you're right, one of the biggest problems, yeah, well, biggest problem, we don't have enough subspecialty measures. But where you can play in 2017 is right here, improvement activities. They don't have to be specialty specific. When you dig through there, there's stuff you can do that would fit. So that's what I was looking at is where can you start to play at least to get your foot in the door Going back to this one right here. Got to find it. Right here. Notice just not to get hurt, submit something. And we're in the test phase. And in the executive rule or the executive summary, it talks about they recognize CMS that we need more measures that can play. So I was trying to find anything that you could potentially start to play with, even as a critical care doc. Do you think down the road there will be more uh, specialty-specific measures? That's one of the calls right now. They're asking for more measures. The downside for a call like that, in the mid-2000s, uh, there was a Senator Grassley. He's still there. He made a deal around SGR. And what the deal around SGR was, if you want your SGR to go up, you got to give me X number of measures in one year. So we got garbage. Okay? So, you know, work with, you know, I'm going to say at SCCM, you know, they're competitive, they're an excellent group. You know, what are they doing in critical care? What is CHESS doing in critical care? What can we put out there that could be a potential measure and start looking at that and working with the professional societies, ATS, SCCM, and, and CHESS. Greg Cooper Smith published article last yeah. year in CHESS, so it would be nice. Uh, a lot of measures can be reported and right. be used for quality, I think. Um, so my second question is, uh, which is, uh, I put it in under the rug, it has to be revenue neutral. So there will always be winners and losers. It right. Be all winners. Although they put an extra 500 million 500 million, I got to read it again. Yeah. In addition to being revenue neutral, there's extra money being yeah, put in, areas. not just rural, for people who really do a good job. So it was interesting. They, extra put, they actually put some extra cash, and I don't, don't hold me to that number. Yeah, I've got to remember. So, in general, revenue neutral, but extra dollars for people who do, you know, super well. Super well. They want to reward the, the super well folks. No. Well, so right now, there's a line like this. So if you look at it, um, and then there's a horizontal line here, below and above the line with the horizontal line, and they put a slope to it. This is how they do it for uh, IPPS, inpatient per, uh, uh, reporting system. Mm -hmm. There are always winners and losers. CMS, it, it, there's going to be losers, there's going to be winners. Hence the slide I showed you where you're being compared to people. You're not doing as well, you're more likely to lose. So those top two, particularly around quality measures, there's going to be losers and there's going to be winners. The interesting part among the winners, they can potentially even get more money out of that extra pool of dollars. Yeah. You bet. So I'm going to say thank you. I appreciate the time. And I'm amazed that you stayed for all this extra time and asked questions. So. Thank you very much. Yeah.